today's message is I'm ready to go. So we're ending the series of I'm ready. And we're getting to a new series of I Am a Lamppost. And so as we talk about New Year's Eve, and, and we, we're, there's some trends that are going on, right? So we know the last Thursday of uh, November is called Thanksgiving, right? And then just the next day is, is Black Friday. So we're so, we're like, oh, I'm thankful, God, for all the many blessings that I have. And then the next day is I need to go get more stuff. Uh, and then we know that... Uh, Christmas is on December 25th, and we received the greatest gift of all. But then the next day, we go back and we return all the other stuff that we didn't like, the ugly sweaters and, and things like that. And I like this uh, picture because it says, I'm returning my son's toy, but he wants to keep the box. Because typically, little kids, that's what they like to do. They play with the box more than they actually play with uh, the gift uh, itself. And then uh, January 1st, as that's tomorrow, is going to be... The, the day that we start our New Year's resolution. So we know that the gyms usually get full with people. There's a bunch of people that go in and people are um, quitting drinking and, and all these other different things. And so December 31st, there's no one in the gym. While January 1st, everyone's in the gym. And in about a few weeks, uh, it's gonna look like, like January 31st again. And people stop, um, stop going to the gym. And, I don't know if you've seen it very much, but I've seen it a lot, where people start posting all these different hashtags. Hashtag gym flow, hashtag I'm on my grind, hashtag gym geek, hashtag uh, gym addict, and all these other things. So people are out there taking pictures of themselves at the gym, but they're actually probably more like this guy right here. The hardest part of going to the gym is just showing up. The second part is finding a comfy chair because they're too busy taking all these pictures that they are not actually working out. So the question is, why is it so hard to stay focused, motivated, and inspired? We have a lot of uh, different things that we want to do in our life. We have a lot of accomplishments that we want to do. We have things that God has put on our heart or ambitions that we have. Why can't we stay focused and motivated? Because everybody says, I want to go to the gym, uh, or I want to do this, I want to do that. But in a few weeks, that motivation is no longer there. So one is fear of failure, one is no time being too busy, and another one is doubt. So we want to talk about those things today. I want to read this quote, as you read it as well, from Les Brown. It says, the graveyard is the richest place on earth because it's where you find that all the hopes and dreams that were never fulfilled, the books that were never written, the songs that were never sung, the inventions that were never shared, the cures that were never discovered. All because someone was too afraid to take that first step. And even as we're thinking about church planning, this is one of those things where it's like, okay, uh, for three years we've been here, and God told us to move to Austin, Texas, to church plan. And for three years we sat on it. For three years we kind of said, no, it's, I'm, I'm not going to do it because I don't have enough time, because I'm afraid I'm going to fail, because we have kids and we have needs and financial things. and. We were waiting for the stars to line up and for the perfect timing to come. And what God was showing is we, if we keep waiting, then this is what's going to be said of us as well. That our hopes are never and our dreams are not going to be fulfilled. The things that God has put in our hearts are, are just going to continue. Uh, there's a lady I used to work for in Massachusetts. Uh, she was about 75. And she said, I'm, working, I'm still working on procrastination. And, you know, the, the whole idea, you know, she's still working on procrastination that she probably been working since she was in her 20s. So if we don't work on it now, we'll never, surely never accomplish it. So the context. So, so I'm going to read the passage and then we're going to talk about the context of it. This is in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 through 26, no, to 33, sorry. <clears throat> So this is a famous passage that many people know about, that Jesus is actually walking on the water. It says, Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. After he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain to pray by himself. When evening came, he was alone. But the boat by this time was long way out from land. It was beaten by waves, this is the boat that the disciples are in, and the waves against it were beating against them. So this is what happened. Jesus just finished feeding the multitudes. He fed thousands of people. 
And after that, he dismisses the people and he says, okay, go home. Now that you've eaten, now you can go back to your journey because some people walked a few miles just to see Jesus. And so he's saying, okay, now that you're fed and you have food in your system, now it's time to go home and, and have a good night rest. And he sends the disciples on their way to the other side of the lake. And after this, Jesus goes and he takes his time to pray. And as he's praying, the disciples are encountering a big wave. So they're not in just this little small boat. And they're not just people who have no idea how to handle a boat because so several of the disciples were actually fishermen. And they understand what it's like to go against these waves. They understand what it's like to go against these different things. So this is not something that was new for them. Um, these are not certain things that they couldn't handle on their own. And that is a situation that's, that's taking place. As we move into the new year, God is moving us little by little by little to say, start believing again. Start believing that He's going to answer prayers. Because sometimes when we don't see prayers answered, we forget that God can answer them. So we stop praying. And I know for myself, when I'm praying for something over and over and over and nothing's happening, then I just stop praying about it. I just stop uh, remembering about that situation. But God is saying it's time to start believing in the promises again, start dreaming again, and start being motivated again. So we have here, the situation that stuck out to me was right here and before Jesus broke the bread and fed the thousands, is that he went by himself to pray. It says that two times in the same chapter, and that's significant. Because it's saying, in the midst of the multitudes, in the midst of everything, Jesus took time to pray. His prayer encourages us. His prayer enables us. His pray, uh, prayer and, and, and time with Jesus and time with God, it grows us. It gives us the boldness to keep going and the motivation. John Piper, Pastor John Piper, wrote a book uh, years ago that says, I'm too busy not to pray. And that's actually the opposite of what we say. We say, I'm too busy to pray. I'm so busy. I got so many things going on. I have to be a husband. I have to be a father. I have to work. And I have these dreams that I want to accomplish. But I don't have time to pray. And so what Jesus was showing us, even at this, even in the success of his ministry, he fed thousands. Even in the success of his ministry, he had to be alone with the Father because that's where he got his strength. He, being around people that constantly he's giving, 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 but he had to find time to be alone with God. And he had to find time to pray. And so we continue with, with the story. So, so Jesus sent them out. So they're about three to four miles away. So the boat is about three to four miles away from shore. And it's, it's probably about three to six a.m. in the morning. So they've been traveling all night. They just finished feeding thousands of people. And now they're against these waves. Now they're in a situation that Jesus actually sent them into. It's interesting because Jesus is the one who sent them without his presence. And he said, I want you to go to the other side of the lake. So they're inside of the storm and they're afraid. Because they don't know what's going on. They don't know what's going to happen. This is a very big storm that's, that's taking place. Because again, they were fishing and they understood what was happening. Uh, verse 25, as the night was ending, Jesus came to them walking on, on, the, on the sea, on the water. When the disciples saw him, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost. And they cried out with fear. This is from the book of Matthew, but the other gospels actually have the same story. And it says Jesus actually intended to walk past them. It's almost as if Jesus was going to race the boat to get to the other side and kind of just appear to them and say, hey, I'm here. But Jesus, in his mind, he intended to actually pass by them and to keep going. And he saw that they were actually struggling. And so he came and he started walking on water towards them. And Jesus says, he spoke to them, have courage. It is I. Ego ate me is the Greek word. And that's actually the same word that God says in the burning bush when he's talking to Moses. He says, I am. The famous I am, I am who I am, I am Yahweh. Jesus uses that same phrase, have courage, I am is here. I am, it is I, do not be afraid. And so when we read the book of Exodus, when God appears to Moses, he's telling Moses, I want you to go and talk to the Pharaoh. I want you to talk to the king. I want you to talk to the ruler over everything. 
And Moses says, but I can't because I can't speak, because I'm afraid, because I'm terrified, because I'm all these different things. And God says, I am who I am. I am with you. So what Jesus is saying and what God was saying to Moses is, it's not because of your skills or your talents, but because I am with you. Because I am with you, you're going to be successful. Because I am with you, you can overcome these things. You can continue. Uh, another thing to note about the idea of the water is, in the time, uh, especially in this time, there wasn't, they didn't have all these different submarines and, and different, different boats to go into the water and kind of know what's going on under there. So the, the water was a very dangerous place. The water was a very scary place. It's, it was known as the abyss. It was just a, just a, a, a world of darkness, of, of things that were unseen. And so they were afraid. They were afraid that they were going to die. And they didn't know what was happening. And I want to read uh, actually another verse that comes from this. is Isaiah 43, 1 and 2. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, the one, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And so again, so God is saying the same thing. What he said in the Hebrew Bible, he said thousands of years ago, he's saying again, I am with you. When you're in the midst of these storms, when you're in the midst of fire, and you feel like there is no way out, they're not going to overtake you because I'm with you. Fear not, I have redeemed you. I have called you by me, by your name, by my name, and you are mine. And then also he says the same thing in Deuteronomy 31 and 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you, and he will not leave you or forsake you. And so again, God is saying the same thing. What he said to them and to the disciples, he's saying, don't be afraid. Have courage. Understand that I am with you, and because I am with you, you're not going to be overtaken. Though it looks like there's a lot of obstacles, though it looks like there's a lot of situations, I am with you, and you're not going to be overcome. Have courage. And so he says it twice. Don't be afraid. Have courage. Don't be afraid. Have courage. And we have to sometimes speak that to ourselves and say, because God is with me, I am not afraid. If God is with me, then who can be against me? And so this is what Peter says. So in the midst of this, so they're in a boat. The boat is being rocked back and forth, and water is coming inside of the boat, and it's raining, and it's just, it's a bad storm. And then they see this figure coming towards them, and they say, oh, it's a ghost. Who can walk on the sea? Who can walk on the water? But a ghost, it has to be a ghost. And so he says, Jesus says to him, have courage. You're not going to be overtaken. Yes, it looks like you're going down, but I am with you. Have courage. Do not be afraid. So Peter says to him, Lord, if it is you, order me to come to you on the water. So it's very interesting what Peter says. He doesn't say, God, if it's you, stop the water. If it's you, calm the sea. If it's you, change my situation. If it's you, then stop what I'm going through. And that's not what he says. But instead he says, God, call me to come upon the water and so I can walk on the water with you. So I can be with you and walk on the seas. God, change me. Don't, my situation is going to stay the same. Most of the time when we pray, we say, God, change my situation. I need more money. I need more time. I need more this. I need more, and all these other long things of this. Instead of saying, God, change me to handle this. Change me to handle this. I remember one of my pastors, uh, Pastor Dave, uh, a mentor of mine, he said, don't pray for God to lighten your load, but pray for a stronger back to carry it. Pray that you can carry that load. Instead of, God, take this load off of my back. And that's what we see Peter doing. He could have said, God, if it's you, if you are God, if it's you, Jesus, then stop the waves. Because that was the situation they were encountering. The, the situation was, we're going to drown. We're going to die. The situation was not, oh, we need to learn how to walk on water so we can escape and get to the other side of the land. But that's what Peter said. Lord, if it's you, 
Then call me upon the sea and I can walk with you. And so Jesus said, come. Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. And I think this is something extraordinary that we overlook. Because what happens next is, and, and I'll actually read it and so we can actually know. What happens next is Peter starts to walk on water. And he's walking towards Jesus. But he looks at the wind and he's afraid and begins to sink and cries out, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. So he's doing something extraordinary. All the other disciples are just kind of just there. They're not really doing anything. They're just kind of watching the situation play out. They're looking at the waves and the sea because they're still going. They're still roaring. There's, there's wind and everything that's going on. And Peter has the boldness to say, God, if it's you, Call me out so I can walk with you. So he starts to walk towards Jesus. He starts walking towards Jesus. And what happens? He's walking on water as well. But he looks at the sea and he looks at the situation. And he takes his eyes off Jesus. And he looks at the situation that's overwhelming. And he starts to sink. And what most people do is they look at this situation. And they say, well, Peter had no faith. But if we were in that situation, we probably would have been like the other disciples in the boat and saying, look at Peter, he's walking on water. And it's funny because this story is actually in almost all the other Gospels, but they leave out the fact that Jesus is walking on water. Uh, in the book of John, um, someone once said that they think the reason uh, Peter is not walking on water is because that kind of makes them look bad. It's like, well, he's walking on water, but I'm not walking on water, so I'm going to leave this out of this this story. We look at Peter when he's walking on water and he has faith and he loses the faith and he looks at the waves instead of Jesus and we say, if that was me, I would have made it. If that was me, I would have been running on water. I would have been flying on water or what have you. Instead of saying, you know what? Jesus was having grace on him and, and we should understand that sometimes we fall too. Sometimes God gives us a word or God tells us to do something and we look at our situation instead of Jesus and we start to sing. And Jesus doesn't rebuke him. He doesn't, well, he, he kind of does. He says, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And it's almost as if he's kind of discouraged. He's like, you were doing it, Peter. You were walking, Peter. You could have continued on. And it's not like, man, Peter, you messed up and... This doesn't, this failure does not negate Peter's apostleship. This does not mean that Peter was no longer saved. This doesn't mean any of that. And sometimes we think that if I fell, God doesn't love me anymore. If I fell, then everyone's going to look at me and say, oh, I'm a failure. And Sebastian is right now, he's actually learning how to walk. And he falls a lot. And he walks, he gets up, and he falls. And even as he's doing that, God is looking at us and he's saying, man, I'm so happy when you're taking that step out of the boat. I'm so happy when you're taking these steps. Uh, there was a pastor uh, in, in La Paz, Mexico, when we went out there. He says, I'd rather be a wet water walker than a dry land talker. And, and I, that kind of just stuck with me because most people are going to criticize us and say, you took that step and you fell. Instead of but they're, they're the ones who never fell. So don't let anyone criticize you for doing anything when they're not doing anything. Don't let anybody say, oh, well, you, you did that and you fell. When they're actually still in the boat and they're dry land talkers. They never got outside of the boat. They never got outside of themselves and did something amazing. The failure did not end Peter's apostleship. And this is not the last time that he will fail. And this is not the last time that we will fail. But... These failures, actually, if we learn from them, then it's going to make us stronger. As we hear of all these different successful people, of all these different people, we hear about uh, Abraham Lincoln. He, he, uh, he was trying to be this, this uh, statementship or this uh, congressman or this different, different things. He failed several times, over and over, every time that he ran. And we hear of Michael Jordan, we hear of Steve Jobs, we hear of all these people. Failure, they didn't succeed in everything that they did. But their failure actually made them stronger. So we have to understand that when we fail, it's not, it's not a sign of a weakness. It's actually, and so start of going into the new year is actually changing our mindset and looking at things in a different context and understanding. We didn't fail a hundred times, 
We just found ways that didn't work until we find a way that does work. And as we continue, uh, so Jesus immediately, he reached out his hand and caught Peter saying, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they went up into the boat, the wind ceased. So now finally, when Jesus and Peter get back into the boat, the wind stops. And this is not the first time that they were in a situation that they were going to drown, they were going to doubt. Uh, those who were in the boat worship God saying, or worship Jesus saying, truly you are the son of God. They seen what happened and they worshiped him. And that's the, that's the kind of the story. But some, some takeaways is, do you believe you are who God says you are? Not who society says you are. Not who your family says you are. Because when we look at the story of Moses, he, was a, he grew up inside of the palace. He grew up inside of the palace of Egypt, the, the strongest power back then. And he had all this might and all this posture. And whenever he ran for his life, for 40 years, he was a shepherd. And God called him and he said, but who am I? He doubted who he was. He doubted his value because he was just a shepherd. He came from this palace where he had all this power, but he was living in a mindset. He says, God, you can't even use me because I can't speak. And God is saying, but I created your mouth. I am the creator. How are you going to say you can't speak when I can give you the words? So do you believe you are who God said you are? Do you believe in who God believes in you? Who God believes in you? So there is a person who God believes in us and God sees in us, but sometimes... We look at what people have said about us. And even whether it's family members or close friends or uh, ex-boyfriends or girlfriends. And people have said things over us. And we carry that. Even though we hate it. And we say, no, I'm not that. Well, we have that struggle. We have that war, the internal war. And then the other question is, why did you stop believing? Why did you stop believing that God can do miracles? Why did you stop believing that God loves us even though we make mistakes? God doesn't stop loving us. We see in Peter's situation, he took his eyes off of Jesus and started looking at his situation. The waves are rising and it's very, it, I, I, he, he probably started walking on water and kind of realized, what am I doing? I'm kind of, I'm walking on water. And as people who are afraid of heights, they get up to a high place and they're starting to do it. And they look down and don't look down. They say, don't look down. And maybe Peter started doing that. But what is, what is it in our situation that caused us to stop believing? Was it once we took that step out, we thought it was going to be easy. We thought it was going to be fun. We thought it was going to be smooth. And then everything happens. When uh, Susie and I moved out here, we moved and things were just starting to move. We, God told us to move to Austin, the church plant. And as soon as we got here, we started meeting other pastors. We started meeting other people who were praying for church planners. And we started just... Everybody we went to, I started doing a lot of concerts. I started going to uh, Houston, San Antonio, Dallas, just all these other places. Doors were just opening. And then uh, it was in September. Then Susie and I both lost our jobs for like three or four months. So there was no income coming in. And then everything, just one after another after another. And we're like, God, you were moving so fast. We were ready to just go and, and just start, start the church right there and then. And our situation got to where we were saying, God, I don't have no money. I don't have no income. I don't have anything. How can I leave people if I have nothing? How can I tell them God's going to provide if you're not providing for me? And so what is the situation? What is that thing that's happening that causes us to stop believing and take our eyes off of Jesus and look at our situation? And what God was telling me is, uh, and, and many people know that, uh, I said it, don't look to God and tell him how big your problems are. Don't say, God, look at my problems. I need money. I need this. I need that. I need people. I need uh, support. I need whatever it is. Instead, look at your problems and tell him how big your God is. There's a mindset that we have to change because we look at our problems and we tell God, look at these things. Don't you see them? The, the disciples are in a boat, and this is, again, this is not the first time, because the first time in chapter 8, they're in a boat, and Jesus is sleeping, and the, the water is overtaking the boat. And they're like, Jesus, don't you care? We're going to die. And he's taking a nap. And he said, I know your situation. I know what you're going through. I see it. It's not, it's not hidden from me. It's not far from me. It's not beyond me. Um, 
when we were coming back from California, uh, what was it, November, God told me there's no fear, there's no lack, there's no doubt, there's no worry in Jesus. And we were on our way to the airport. And as you all know, we actually miss our, uh, we miss our flight on the way to California, so this is on our way back from California. And God told me, there's no fear, there's no worry, there's no doubt, there's no lack in Jesus. And so I was just kind of thinking about it, because we were on our way to, to San Francisco, it was a three hour drive. And I told Susie, I was like, you know, I feel God is telling me, there's no fear, there's no worry, there's no lack, there's no doubt in Jesus. And she's like, okay. You know, I, and I didn't even want to tell her, because I was like, well, maybe God is just speaking this for me. And so, so anyway, so I told Susie, I was trying to be obedient. So she drops me off to take, uh, oh, actually, I drop her off and the kids, and then I'm taking the rental car back. As I'm taking the rental car back, we have about an hour to, before we have the flight. So we're, we're, we're afraid because we missed our flight. We're afraid because we're in a land where our closest friends are hours away, so, or uh, about an hour away. So I'm, I'm panicking. I'm like looking at my watch. She's looking at her watch. like, okay, we got to get checked in. We got to do it quick. We got to do it quick. And so as I'm... Um, we turn the car, and we have about 45 minutes left for 15, or th yeah, I think we, it took 15 minutes to get there. And she says, our flight says that we're actually supposed to leave in a month from now. We're not supposed to be back in Austin, Texas until a month from today. And so we're like, I'm like, what? How did that happen? And so uh, instead of playing the blame game, I says, you know, so in my mind, I'm thinking that's going to be a lot of money to change that flight. That's going to be a thousand dollars easy. And, you know, what time are we going to get there? I have to go back to work because I already missed this many days of, of work. And so I'm thinking this thing. And I said, you know what? God said there's no fear. There's no worry. There's no doubt. There's no lack in Jesus. And so he gave me that word because he knew the situation I was about to get in. And I said, okay. And I told Susie, I'm like, that's what God said. And this is why. And I said, I got to go because I. I, uh, I didn't want to continue feeding those doubts. And, and, and she says, okay. And so I'm just praying. I'm like, God, you said there's no worry. There's no fear. There's no doubt. There's no lack in Jesus. And Jesus is in me. So these situations are not going to overtake me. And so she calls back and she says, I talked to them. And they want to charge $1,000. They want to do this. They want to do that. And there's no flights and this and that. And, and, I, and I told her again, I'm like, this is what God says. She's like, all right, I'm going to go talk to them. So she talks to them. They find a way, there's, there's enough seats for us, and we don't have to pay a dime, and we get on that flight. And we're like, all right, God, this is you. You, you, you said this, and I'm going to keep believing it. I'm going to keep saying that whenever my situation is rising, and my situation looks like it's going to overtake me, there is no fear. And so these are certain things that I wanted to, to say. These are some steps as we go into the new year, continue. It's, it's a continual process. Because it doesn't happen, because I still go through things and I go straight to worry instead of confidence. And so, one is dream. We have to continue to start dreaming. And I was talking to Mike yesterday about this dream that God gave me 10 years ago. And God is starting to say, I keep telling you about this dream, but you think it's just a dream. But I want to make this a reality. I want to use you to do something that's beyond yourself. And when we do something beyond ourselves, it's scary. And it's fearful. And people are going to say that we're crazy. And they're going to say, why didn't you do this? Well, I didn't have those resources. I didn't have that. All I had was a vision. And so dream and let God start speaking. But don't negotiate with yourself. Because our self is a liar. And our self wants to be comfortable. We want to be comfortable. We want to just relax and just retire. And just, you know, go collect seashells and other things like that. And we negotiate with ourselves. Um, I think it was Tony Robbins. Um, he was, I was listening to a podcast of him the other day. He says at 5.30 in the morning, he wakes up and the first thing he does is he jumps into a pool that's about 50 degrees. He says, I don't like doing that. I'm not a masochist. I don't like pain. But I don't negotiate with myself. I tell my body what I'm going to do. I tell my brain what I'm going to do. I, and, and even Paul says that. We are flesh into submission. We tell it where we're going. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to wake up. I'm going to pray. I'm going to believe. I'm going to have faith. I'm going to do this. Because our mind is always trying to see what's the safe route. What can I do? And God is not always the God of, of, of the safe. He's not always the God of the short. He always calls us out into the sea. 
Don't look to God and tell him how big your problems are. Look to your problem. Tell him how, how big your God is and just go. Just go. I'm not saying to quit your job today, but go. Start doing something every day, even if it's something small. Start doing it, working on it, thinking about it, dreaming about it. Let it consume you, these passions, these dreams, these visions. Let it consume you. And then also, if you sink, God will lift you up. We see from Peter's situation, he sank, but God lifted him up. God is gracious that even if we are going in the wrong path, he's going to direct us. He's going to get us onto that right path. And these are other things that I wanted to say is replace. We have to replace the fear of failure with opportunity. This is not a failure. This is an opportunity. This is just a situation where we can look at it and say, how could I have done this differently? How can I have done it this way? How can I think about it in a different term? So when we have those failures, we can look at them as opportunities. And one of the biggest reasons people continue to fail is because we don't reflect enough. We, we have a failure. I never want to think about that failure again. I never want to experience that again. But if we take the time and say, why did I fail? Was it a lack of planning? Was it a lack of discipline? Was it a lack? What, what was that situation that made me fail? Was I not ready yet? And I thought I was ready. Or was my, my faith, what, did I doubt myself? What, what was it? What was that situation? So look at those as opportunities and start dissecting them and say, okay, yes, that I fell and I hate that feeling. So let me work on, on using that as motivation not to do it over again. <coughs> um, a few weeks ago when I was walking, just passing out flyers, God was, gave me the word that miracles only happen when you're in impossible situations. If something happens, that's normal. It's not a miracle. That's just the norm. That's the regular thing. But if we're in situations where our flight is delayed or our, we're going to miss our flight again, and God says, no, believe, and we believe, those are miracles. Believe in miracles happen only when we're in possible situations. When we're in situations that we say, God, I have nothing. I have no, no anything. So he can get the glory. If it's my, my skill, my talent, and it's all on me, then I can say, yeah, I did it. Look at what I built. Look at what I did. Look at all this that I had. So those resources are what I can say, are, are what gets the glory. But if we're in an impossible situation, God gets the glory. If we say that we're in no time, we have no time, we're too busy, then start disciplining ourselves. Uh, John Maxwell, who writes many, many books, he was talking about the idea that he... He has every single thing of his life scheduled. And he's very, very intense about it. He looks like today he will be looking at the rest of his, the 2017, every single appointment he has and he looks at it and he says, what did I do here? What did I waste time in? And he just, he looks at it down to the T. He schedules time that he's gonna be uh, relaxing, time that he's gonna watch TV, time that he's gonna spend writing books, time that he's gonna spend with his wife. He schedules everything. In, and, and so we kind of think, oh, that's messed up. You have to schedule time with your wife. But sometimes when we're doing a lot of things, we have to do that because otherwise we won't have time with our spouses. We'll be watching TV and, and sometimes typing notes or reading books and doing this, and we're not enjoying those times. <laughs> We're not enjoying that time. We're not enjoying that time together. It's not quality time. It's time together, but it's not quality. And so sometimes we have to start there and schedule that time in because that's what I do a lot. So I'll be watching a TV show while I'm listening to something, while I'm typing this, while I'm trying to talk to the kids. It's not working, <coughs> but I need to be more disciplined. And uh, the last CD that I wrote, or two CDs ago, I was in, uh, in seminary, so I was taking four classes, and we had to translate a bunch of parts of the Bible, so I was very busy, plus I had two jobs, and, got, and I was saying, I'm too busy, I'm too busy, I'm too busy, but now when I look at my phone, it has an app that shows me how much time I use on Facebook, or on this game, and I'm spending hours on it, and I'm like, I'm not too busy, I'm just misusing my time, and sometimes we need to look at where our time goes, because if we don't schedule our time, our time will take over us, and then the last thing, replace doubt with confidence, replace doubt with confidence, when we doubt, we have confidence, but not in ourselves, we have confidence in God, and that's what Jesus was saying, ego ain't me, I am, we have to have confidence in who God is, that God is with us, and he says, even when the waters are raging, 
They're not going to overtake you. Even when it looks like you're in a place and you're going to be burned, you're not going to be burned by the fires because I am with you. And so that's kind of where I want to leave it. As we go into the new year, these are some just some easy steps that we can start working on every day, every day, every day. Um, most people, they get into the gym and they work out hours, 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 and they start hard, but then they drop off because it's the small steps, the small decisions. It's the small, no, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not going to believe that. Every day that makes success. It's not just these big changes. So these are some action steps that we can do. Replace that mindset and start uh, dreaming again. Start looking at our, our time and schedule. And don't negotiate any with ourselves and, and other things like that. So, so that's kind of where I wanted to leave it. As we look at the situation with Peter, he had faith. And not to look at Peter and say, oh, look at Peter. Peter was, you know, he was that, that guy a little faith. Because sometimes we do the same thing. If that was us, we would say, oh yeah, I would, I would surely stand for Jesus. No, we won't. Unfortunately, sometimes, hopefully we get to that point. But we don't have to be the heroes because Jesus is our hero. We don't have to be the person who gets the victory because it's Jesus who does. So let's go ahead and pray. And so, yeah, let's pray. <laughs> Father, I thank you, Lord, that you are telling us to go. You're telling us to go in different areas, God. Maybe it's finances. Maybe it's in dreaming of again. Lord, maybe it's in something that you want us to start and to do. Father, I pray for faith to rise and doubt to shrink. Doubt to, to die. We would starve doubt and we would feed our faith, Lord. Our faith will rise up, Lord Jesus. I pray, God, we would take steps like Peter did. He took steps outside of the boat. <coughs> he didn't care what they said. He didn't care what they were going to make fun of him and say, Oh, Peter, you're trying to be super spiritual. But he was the one, the only one to walk on water. And we can remember him of that, God. Even though he sank, Lord, you pulled him up and he continued to rise up again. Rise up again, Father. So I thank you, God. You're telling us to go. And you're, you're giving us the faith to rise up again. God, I thank you, Lord Jesus, for all the visions and all the dreams and all the miracles and all that you are going to do in our lives, Lord. And we have to understand that it's not going to be easy, but you're going to be with us. You are with us and you are walking with us, Father, and you are not going to leave us by ourselves. So I pray, God, I pray against the lies of the enemy, I pray against doubt, I pray against fear, I pray against loneliness, I pray against desperation or, uh, and de depression. I pray, Father, against all the lies that the enemy has said. The worry, the doubt, the fear, the lack that we say, oh, we're going to do something for God, but we don't have enough. God, there is more than enough in your kingdom. You are not a bad king. Even bad kings provide for those peasants in, in the kingdom. But we are your sons and daughters in the greatest kingdom of all, God. You are surely going to provide for your children. Father, I pray that 2018 will be a year where we break off these, shack these shackles and we continue to walk in freedom. We're not just free outside of the prison cell, but we walk out of the prison cell. And we help others, God. Father, I thank you for what you are doing. I thank you, Father, that you have called us, Lord. And we thank you, God, because you're going to get the glory. You're going to get the credit, Father. We're in these impossible situations so that you can show how faithful you are, Lord. And we just thank you in the name of Jesus, we pray.